It is, it's not. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, this is joint work together with colleague uh, Britta Hale and Sebastian Lauer, who are both here, as well as uh, Tibor Jager. And it's about key exchange. So this nice principle, this neat principle, that allows two remote parties to establish a shared symmetric crypto key over an insecure connection. Now in practice, it turns out that this key exchange step can be quite a bottleneck. So assume you have one message that needs to be sent back and forth between the client, Alice, and Bob, the server, and this means that Alice has to wait for this one round trip time before she can actually send data. So now if you're on a high latency, for example, a mobile network, this will incur quite an overhead, quite a delay of potentially many hundred milliseconds. So a solution to this is to employ a zero round trip time key exchange protocol. A key exchange protocol is zero round trip time if it requires only a single message to be sent from the client to the server in order to establish a key. This means that Ellis, along with this key exchange message, can already use that key to encrypt data that just travels along with that message. So he doesn't have to wait for a response from the server. Now, the round-trip time key exchange is theoretically not a new concept, but has gained quite some practical uh, attention over the last years for being an explicit goal in Google's Quick protocol, as well as in the upcoming TLS version 1.3. There are, however, two main security drawbacks with zero round-trip time key exchange. They're both kind of stemming from the fact that the, that the server cannot actively contribute to that exchange. The first one is replay attacks. The adversary may simply go and copy the key exchange message and the accompanying message, uh, the accompanying data being sent, and replay this to the server. Now, if the server doesn't take extra care, it will just decrypt this data again, and basically what you have is a replayed message, or replayed data in any sense. Now, it turns out in some settings, this is essentially unavoidable, as, for example, has been discussed by Eric Riscola and Adam Langley at last year's Real World Crypto. The second big issue with the round time key exchange is forward secrecy, or rather, the lack of it. So, the server will use some kind of secret key to authenticate and derive the session key for that key exchange. Now, if, if an adversary later compromises that key, because there is no ephemeral contribution from the server, it has everything to decrypt the data because it can derive the same key just simply again. Now, as you know, forward secrecy is considered a crucial, a crucial uh, and very important security goal in particular to uh, prevent mass surveillance. So this means the lack of it here is particularly unfortunate, but commonly considered an inherent limitation of zero round trip time key exchange. In this work, we however show that this common belief is actually false. So we built a zero round trip time key exchange protocol which achieves full forward secrecy. So to understand how this works, let's first have a look at a somewhat related scenario that of asynchronous messaging. So here, Alice wants to send some message over to Bob without any preceding communication. Well, this can be solved, of course, by pure, simple public key encryption. You just encrypt this message under the public key of Bob, and that's what you want to do. But this leaves you with the same problem of lacking forward secrecy, of course. Now, already back in 2003, Kanati, Halevi, and Katz showed how to achieve a coarse notion of forward secrecy by employing a hierarchical identity-based encryption scheme in this setting. So for this, you would divide time into some coarse intervals, and then a secret key corresponds to each of this interval. Now, when an adversary comes and compromises some, some secret key, this means you cannot decrypt messages from earlier intervals. Still, within the same interval, it can decrypt all your messages being sent. So it's just giving you some coarse grain notion of forward secrecy. And this is why in 2015, Green and Myers came up with a more fine-grained approach to forward secrecy, which they called puncturable forward secret encryption. And for this, they fused this Hive approach with an additional attribute-based encryption scheme 
And this allows you to take the secret key of some interval and puncture out the capability to decrypt specific ciphertext you've seen already. And by this removing this capability, you get forward secrecy for these ciphertexts. And this is where our idea starts for this work. So our core observation is that this type of puncturable forward secret encryption relatively directly yields forward secret zero time key exchange. Our technical contribution is then twofold. So the first thing is we establish puncturable forward secret key encapsulation as the core building block for this protocol. So here encapsulation simply means instead of encrypting a message, we're encrypting a symmetric key. We then show how to build such PFS cams in a generic way uh, from any hierarchical identity based cam such that we achieve strong CCA security without relying on the random oracle, and that way improving over the previous uh, designs. In the second step, we then show again generically how to build from any such PFS cam a forward secret zero round to time key exchange protocol. As part of this, we formalize what key exchange security means for forward secret zero round to time and prove that our protocol achieves the security you want to see there. Now, as I don't have time to go into any real details, let me give you an overview, a glimpse of how our protocol works. So we have Alice and Bob, Alice holding the public key of Bob and Bob the corresponding secret key. Now in order to run a session, what Alice will do, it will sim she will simply uh, encapsulate a symmetric key for Bob and sends over this encapsulating ciphertext. At this point, you can immediately use this key as well to, encrypt, to start encrypting data. On the other side, Bob will then do two things. First of all, it will decapsulate the key, at this point able to decrypt the data that might be arriving from Alice. And then the second step is it will take its secret key and puncture out, that is, remove the capability to derive this key again. And this is what gives you this immediate forward secrecy. <laughs> So how is this puncturing functionality enabled in the protocol in this design? So essentially, the secret key Bob holds is a part of a hierarchical key structure. In the beginning, Bob will hold the root node in this tree. Now, if a ciphertext arrives, let's say 0, 1, Bob will use this root node to derive the secret key corresponding to that ciphertext in order to decapsulate. It will then puncture this key, and by this it means it removes all the nodes on the way from the root node to this leaf node in order to not be able anymore to, decrypt, to, to derive this key again. Instead, as the new secret key, it will store the siblings on the path from the root to the leaf, and uh, this allows him to derive still all the other keys in the tree. Now this process is repeated, and uh, when, a new, when the next ciphertext arrives, it first decapsulates the corresponding, with the corresponding secret key, and then punctures out this capability. Now if Bob would just proceed like this, the secret key size will grow rather quickly, uh, namely linear in the number of sessions that Bob's running. So we need to uh, do some more here. And what we do is we need to add another layer uh, on top of this tree which separates the, which divides this tree into some coarse time intervals the two parties agree on, and can be, for example, days. Now, when one time interval is over, Bob can simply remove the corresponding subtree and by this reduce the size of the secret key back to a logarithmic amount of, of data to be stored. Okay, so what are the properties of the scheme now, of this protocol? Well, first of all, it achieves full forward secrecy through this puncturing approach. This is, as soon as the key exchange is over, leaking, compromising the, public, the secret key of Bob will not affect the security of this session anymore. Puncturing also gives you replay protection, at least on the key exchange level, because you simply can't decapsulate the same ciphertext twice. For performance, we did a rough implementation based on a hype scheme based by Blasi, Kiltz, and Pan, which was published at Crypto 2014. As it turned out, this was not the optimal choice. I'll come to that in a second. Um, but we still want to share this initial evaluation with you here. So first of all, on the client side, encapsulation is very efficient, taking only a few milliseconds, like in the order of like 10 milliseconds on a regular laptop. 
On the server side, the pure decapsulation of the key in order to be able to decrypt takes the same amount of time, but deriving in the tree the corresponding secret key, depending on how the tree looks like, may be relatively expensive and can take up to roughly a second. And this key delegation, this key derivation step, is particularly expensive in this BKP scheme, so this is why it was not an optimal choice, um, and which means that puncturing in particular can be very costly, or is very costly, because there are potentially many intermediate nodes to be derived in order to come up with the next uh, punctured secret key. Still, while this is now not a practical instantiation, there is hope for two reasons. First, there are other schemes which have more efficient uh, key delegation, so that's not a particular focus on hype schemes, but there are other schemes, for example, by Genevieve and Silverberg, where this step is more efficient, and it's not, this needs to be look at, looked at. Second, the BKP scheme provides the strong notion of adaptive security, where actually our scheme only requires the weaker, a weaker notion, namely selective security. So that means there are, there's quite some space for improvements, both on the implementation side, as well as for research in better suited hype schemes that can be then just plugged into this generic construction. Okay, so to summarize, first of all, fully forward secret zero round trip time key exchange exists. So we show uh, this by providing a simple protocol which is provably secure and where the core building block, punctuable forward secret key encapsulation can be built from any hierarchical identity-based CAM scheme. The big open question is how to make this practical, both through optimized schemes and optimized implementations of the schemes. Right, this brings me to the end of my talk. Thank you very much for your attention. So we have a couple of minutes for questions. Uh, go right ahead. Hi. I'm interested in um, your thoughts on denial of service attacks against that scheme. I was thinking if the initial size of the message ALS sends Bob is either relatively small, um, Mallory could, for example, just send enough of her own um, to puncture out a large portion of that tree, or if it's large enough, that's not feasible, just send enough to hopefully overwhelm memory on Bob's side trying to keep track of this tree before he needs to expire it. Yeah, so, so definitely, I mean, as, because there's some, quite some heavy crypto involved on the server side, thus resilience is something to, to be looked at. In particular, you want to add, potentially, if you're, if you're under, under attack, you want to add some cookie mechanisms to be sure that at least the clients that want to talk to you are legitimate and really do want to talk to you and this kind of stuff. But it's beyond what, what we looked into here. Thank you. Welcome. Hello. Oh. Um, can you talk about how your scheme works with a fleet of servers that don't share real-time state? Because that's what session tickets solve for us in TLS, and if we, didn't, if we had a shared state, we'd probably just use essentially session IDs. So can you, yeah. can you talk about that, please? Sure. So um, the, in this, this tree, basically, so one thing is like you have to split it across the time, and then within a time interval, the, uh, the tree is basically formed along the, the ciphertext. So what you could do for some kind of load balancing is that you would say, uh, par like I, I split the range or the, the space of these ciphertexts uh, among my servers that I have, and then each of the server has to keep consistent state within this share of the, of the ciphertext area. I was thinking more about um, geographical distributed network like Cloudflare, Cyanicast. We have like one pop in, I don't know, Europe, one in, the US, and we can't just load balance between the, the two based on ciphertext. OK. Um, I'm, we would need to look into this closer. I don't have a Thank you. answer on top of that. Thanks. Yeah. Um, execution of the puncturing step seems to rely on the message actually arriving. Um, could the adversary attack the forward secrecy properties of the system simply by dropping messages? Sorry, can you repeat the last? Could sentence? the adversary attack the forward secrecy properties of the system simply by dropping messages? In, so the point is, like you, you will get, you will do the puncturing as soon as the message arrives. So in particular, if you if you can if you hold the message in flight, and like that you you compromise in that sense, you compromise basically the service key before he sees the message and can puncture. You don't get forward secrecy guarantees. Yes. So you need to process 
Yeah, you need, you need to see the message, you need to process the message in order to like say, okay, now I, I can't do this again. Uh, yeah, but, it's a, but dr dro dropping a message doesn't have to be something deliberately performed by an adversary. The network can, will do that on its own. Sure, sure. Like, but if the message is dropped and like in the same time you don't, you don't see the key, then uh, yeah, you don't do the secrecy there. Uh, yeah, I was just going to ask, uh, this is kind of a, a really basic thing about implementing this. This protocol seems to require the ability to forget data. That, and if you're doing this on like a mobile device with flash drive, with standard flash memory, that's not so easy. Have you thought at all about what you need to do to, to make sure that you can actually forget the data, or is that just something that's outside the scope of what you're working on? No, so for now this, I mean, we, we didn't look into this, but like for any type of secret, or forward secrecy where you need to forget a key at yeah. some point in time in order to not reveal it anymore, you're in this, in this trouble of uh, how, to, how to securely erase data. Yes, that's, right. that's non-trivial. So ultimately, TLS 1.3 decided not to do zero RTT key agreement, but instead do zero RTT resumption with a shared symmetric secret, and you sent a ticket along with it. I'm wondering, it seems like you can adapt this method for forward secrecy to apply to the key servers used to decrypt the tickets, where when you encrypt the ticket, you don't use a single key for all the tickets you're encrypting, but you go walk down this tree and pick something from the root, encrypt it, and then when you receive it again at a later timestamp, you erase the symmetric key you used along the path. So you mean like fusing this together in the sense of using this, the leaf node as your secret key, like the appreciate key in the TLS style design? So the, the, this is just the implementation detail on the server where you have keys encrypting tickets. And the concern is that the ticket encryption keys have to be kept for long periods of time if you want zero RTT to work over those periods of time. Mm -hmm. And this idea of going down the tree and erasing might help ameliorate that. Maybe. Let's, let's talk on that offline, maybe. Good. Okay. Any more questions? Okay. We're out of time anyway. So uh, let's thank Felix. Thank you very much. Yeah.